Are we good? All right. So here we go. Let's go from uh, this part right here. Uh, we wrap this up. So five, one of the last checks and balances to mention here is that the Supreme Court, right, is checked by the altering jurisdiction by Congress, the removal of federal judges, and finally, they are checked by the fact that it takes the Senate's approval um, of presidential appointments to the courts. All right, let's talk about the makeup of the court. There are three levels to the federal courts. At the lowest level, we have the federal district courts, right? There are about 94 district courts in the United States of America. There are 12 federal courts of appeal. These are also known as the federal circuit courts. There are 12 circuit courts in the United States of America. And then finally, we have the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land. They have final say on almost everything. And there are six members of the Supreme Court initially as set by the Judiciary Act of 1789. That number today is at nine. There are nine Supreme Court justices in the U.S. The reason why this is called the Circuit Court is that in the early years, uh, the justices who were on the Circuit Court rode up to 10,000 miles a year. They rode the Circuit. Uh, pretty intense. Uh, many of them slept out in the wild at night. But that is where we get that. So that is the makeup of the court. If you look at this map, you will see what it looks like. The dotted lines here, so if you look down here, if you look over here, those dotted lines, those delineate where our circuit courts are. Right? Sorry, where our district courts are. The circuit courts, that is the color. So 9th, 10th, 11th, 5th, 8th. The 12th circuit court is located over here in Washington, D.C. So they have the 12th district court. Sorry, 12th circuit court. I get those mixed up. Circuit court, district court. 12 circuit courts, 94 district courts. Um, not really based upon population. It's more so just how they parcel it out. Margaret and Madison will mention again, although I think this is pretty straightforward at this point, right? Madison... Secretary of State doesn't deliver Marbury's appointment to his court position. He sues. It gets to the Supreme Court. Marshall's kind of in a pickle. Does he side with the president? Does he side against the president? He doesn't really want to do either. So what he does instead is he declares that Marbury deserves to get the appointment. He's supposed to get the appointment. But what he comes to the conclusion of is that the Federal Judiciary Act 1789, which grants him the power, uh, John Marshall, the power to have this delivered, he states that that is unconstitutional. The reason why this is important is it creates what we now know of as judicial review and gives the Supreme Court the power to declare laws constitutional or unconstitutional. So it greatly expands the powers Here's our makeup of the court. As I stated earlier, there are two systems in the United States. There's the state system and there's the federal system. They exist side by side. If you are dealing with state law, a state crime, you will start here and you will work your way up, right? Appeal to the state intermediate appellate courts. Uh, they have no original jurisdiction, neither does the U.S. Court of Appeals. These two intermediary courts, the middle courts, do not have the power of original jurisdiction. Supreme Court does. The highest state courts, which is the state Supreme Courts, they do. And then the district courts and the trial courts all have original jurisdiction. But only the Supreme Court would have original and applicant. These state trial courts are split up in between civil and criminal. If there's a crime you've broken and there's jail time possibility, you will be dealing with a criminal court. If it's a lawsuit, child custody, divorce proceedings, all of those, those will begin in an appellate court. Those will, uh, sorry, those will begin in a uh, civil case, civil court, no jail time, but there will be funds and money on the line. So that is the two court systems that exist in our country. The Supreme Court. There are nine justices. There have been nine justices in 1789. The reason for this 
is they don't want a tie. They want there to be a tiebreaker. The ninth judge is able to break that tie. You don't have to worry about things getting stuck in the mud. Very small support staff. Consists of about 400. Um, justices handle their support staffs differently. Some treat it more like a family. Some treat it more like a business. Um, and a lot of that affects how the work is done. Uh, these support staffs are very important. They do a lot of research. Oftentimes their opinions are actually heard by the justices. So they actually do have quite a bit of effect on the way the Supreme Court rules, which is an interesting thing to bear in mind that this isn't always the case in other branches, but it is the case here. When it comes to the Supreme Court, their decisions are almost always influenced by what we call precedent. What is precedent? Um, it's like you set... No, it's like you, you do something right and it sets an example for yeah. the following. Yeah. Right? To set precedent is exactly what you said, Katie. To set precedent is to set an example for the following. And not just an example that you might follow. This means something that you're probably going to follow. Right? Precedent is very important. It's integral to the operation of the Supreme Court. Because this is what justices look at when they're making decisions. Right? This is what support staffs do. They peruse earlier laws. They peruse earlier cases. And they determine what should be our ruling here. How should we come down on this? Now, this doesn't mean that they always listen and follow precedent. Sometimes they break from it. But precedent is always involved one way or another in the discussion, along with something called stare decisis. Yeah, Latin for, like, to stand or something. Yeah, to leave it be, to let it stand, let it alone. Right? Stare decisis is this idea that you should let precedent just be. If there's a precedent, if there's an example to follow, you follow it. You go along with what it says. Some justices are more on board with stare decisis than others. Uh, there are a couple of our Supreme Court justices that are strict constructionists. They call themselves constitutionalists. They believe that if the Constitution says it, that's the way it is. If it doesn't say it, it's not there for a reason. You shouldn't put it into play. So they would be more, they would sigh a lot with this leave it alone idea. Now that changes, right? We see this in the 2015 gay marriage stuff. Roe v. Wade, uh, Brown v. Board, right? Brown v. Board broke from precedent, right? Plessy v. Ferguson set up segregation. Brown v. Board breaks from. Wait, what was Plessy versus Ferguson again? Segregation. Uh, segregation. That's it set up segregation. But how did they make it constitutional, like? Back Separate then? but equal. Oh. I see. Separate but equal is what makes segregation okay. Uh, Brown v. Board states that separate but equal is inherently unequal. Right? And that's how they break from precedent. Mm -hmm. So they do break from the past. Right? It happens. Yeah. Wait, what's the difference between a judge and a justice? Justice is only Supreme Court, right? And judges... Yeah. Justice is Supreme Court. But justices are judges. Yes. Okay. But you, right, you're, you're... The reason why we call them justices is if you look at the Supreme Court and the way those trials go and those cases go, it doesn't look like a typical trial, right? There's no jury. There's no witnesses. There's none of that. It's literally, and we'll talk about this more in a second, your nine Supreme Court justices sit up front. The lawyer for one side gets 30 minutes. The lawyer for the other side gets 30 minutes. And then they go and they deliberate. Right? Because a lot of the research is done through documentation, through, uh, we talked about uh, amicus curry briefs when we were talking about interest groups, right? A lot of those are read by the justices. They're justices because they, they're dealing with a higher question. What factors are involved when the president is selecting potential appointments to the Supreme Court? Um, like political affiliations, sure. experience, sure. Um, likability. <laughs> Yeah, no likability. Uh, have they had scandals? Are they popular? What's involved in this process? Right? Those are all factors. Ideology is a big one, though. A president wants somebody who agrees with their ideology. They don't want somebody who's ideological, ideologically opposite of them. Oh, yeah. And race, ethnicity, and religion. Sure. Yeah. Especially now. That wouldn't have been something a couple years ago, but that is something now. Um, 
it just kind of like got really fady for a second. Oh. So I was just making sure it was okay. I thought it was dying of some sort of computer disease. Oh. It's not though. It's okay. Right? So those are factors that are involved in the process. Here's the simple answer to this question. The public only really pays attention to the Supreme Court when there's a big case. Most of the time, the public is aware of the Supreme Court to the degree that the public is critical and aware of Congress and the President. A lot of this is the own doing of the Supreme Court. They keep themselves out of the public eye a lot more than the other two branches. Like they don't record stuff. Like record stuff. You can't take pictures during the hearings. Nobody, nobody is allowed in the conference room where the Supreme Court deliberates on a hearing. Right? Once they're done listening to the arguments, they go into a private chamber. Only the nine Supreme Court justices are allowed in that private chamber. No staff, no nothing. You have to be a justice to be back there during the deliberation. What's the criteria to be a Supreme Court member? So, so um, an Ivy League degree. Yeah. Citizen, Citizen, Citizen academic, academic degree. The interesting thing is when we look at experience, most of the time they have some sort of experience in the U.S. Court of Appeals. The common one is law professor because these people would be familiar with the law. You don't just want somebody who's a judge. You want somebody who's very familiar with American law. Different ideas, how laws changed, how policy has changed, what have been the major laws throughout time. Those are things you want your justice to be familiar with. And finally, it's not uncommon for somebody to have White House counsel experience, which means they were a lawyer to the president. Ideology is key, though. A president wants allies in the Supreme Court. Not only do they want allies, it's the dream of every president to get to create a Supreme Court that is ideologically similar to them, so that when they leave office, when they can't run for president anymore, when their time as president is done, the Supreme Court carries over to the next presidency and it's ideologically similar to them. Right? This poses a potential roadblock to somebody from the other party coming in and overturning everything we've done. Religion is interesting. Currently, most of our Supreme Court is not Protestant, and this is new. Uh, prior to this, right, you look at throughout most of US history, most of the Supreme Court would have been Protestant. That has shifted. Like Catholic or something. Catholic is the predominant. Catholic, 